taught us. If I may, excuse me, if I may, we are going to start in just a few moments. If you are on an aisle where there is empty seats, if you will slide in. We want to leave the open seats on the edge of the rows in the interior and then on the round the room. So if you have an empty seat, please slide in. Thank you.
Is that it? There we go. Good evening, everyone. Sorry about that. <laughs> On behalf of the City of Milton and our council and our event partners at the Summit Counseling Center, I'd like to welcome you all to Milton City Hall. How many of you have here tonight have not been in our city hall? Raise your hand. Great. We're glad to have you here. I got a little side story. When we were designing City Hall and we told our design team we wanted something a little different, we wanted to have kind of the wow factor and that by wow, I mean not wow because it's fancy, but more wow, it's really neat. Um, and when we hired an architect, and people think I'm crazy when I tell them, we hired an architect that had never built a city hall, never designed a city hall or a, or a government building before. And they, they say, why? And I say, look around. <laughs> so we're honored to have you all join us for this important community conversation tonight. I want to thank our panelists for agreeing to be here and participate in tonight's town hall or town hall discussion. I'd like to also um, offer a special thanks for Milton Moms, Laura Mastaki and Britt Bean for the courage to share their family story with us tonight. Before I read the official proclamation recognizing the National Suicide Prevention Week in Milton, I'd like to welcome a few special guests we have with us tonight. We've got our speaker pro tem, Jan Jones. We've got, um, I know uh, Fulton County Commissioner Bob Ellis is on his way. He'll be here in a few minutes. Our county manager in the back, Dick Anderson. Um, Katie Reeves, our Fulton County School Board representative, she'll be here in a few minutes. Um, Laura Bentley, our on City Council, Rick Morrig, and Matt Koontz are here tonight. So thank you guys for being here. When Councilmember Laura Bentley approached me about the idea of hosting a suicide prevention symposium, I immediately knew it was something the city needed to do. Not only have we lost teen residents to suicide, but I believe tonight's discussion strikes at the very heart of the city's mission. If Milton's to be the best place to call home, we have to be willing to discuss difficult topics like suicide. We understand that talking about suicide removes the stigma, and you'll learn more about that tonight, but talking is the first step towards prevention. Each one of you here tonight has taken, has taken that first step by your willingness to be a part of that conversation. That's why tonight's forum is so important. And for that reason, the City Council issued a proclamation last night declaring this week as National Suicide Prevention Week in Milton. And I'm going to read the proclamation. Whereas National Suicide Prevention Week is an annual week-long campaign in the United States to inform and and engage health professionals and the general public about suicide prevention and the warning signs of suicide. And the World Suicide Prevention Day is recognized annually on September 10th. And whereas suicide is now the second leading cause of death among people ages 15 to 24. And whereas one of the myths about suicide is that talking about it causes suicide when research shows the opposite. Engaging someone in a deliberate, caring conversation about suicide is shown to be the first step towards preventing suicide. And whereas the city of Milton is constantly striving to provide the best quality of life to its residents by finding the ways to create a strong sense of community and provide connectiveness. And whereas if Milton is to be the best place to call home, we must be willing to discuss this difficult topic like suicide, recognizing that talking about suicide removes the stigma and is the first step towards prevention. And whereas all members of the city of Milton take responsibility together to provide the best quality of life to those we serve. Through our caring service, we strengthen our cherished sense of community. Now, therefore, we, the mayor and the city council of the city of Milton, proclaim September 10th, Suicide Prevention Day in Milton, and actively demonstrate the city's commitment to the health and well-being of its citizens by hosting a community forum, Suicide, a community conversation at our city hall on Tuesday, September 10th, in an effort to provide insight, understanding, and hope about suicide. And that's given under my hand and the seal of the city of Milton, Georgia, on the ninth day of September 2019. And I also personally want to just thank uh, Laura Lynn and, and Brett for being here tonight. Um, I know it's, it's, it's a, a tough thing. 
Um, I, uh, I met Ivy, Laura Lynn's daughter, one time and uh, knew that she was a really a special girl. And uh, I didn't meet Reagan, Britt's son, but uh, I know just going to his funeral and just uh, hearing all the stories about him and, and seeing pictures and all, I know he was a great kid. So um, I just want to thank you guys for being here and also let you know, speaking from my heart, as well as I know everybody in this room and, and, and our entire community, my heart still aches for you guys. And I know that it could have been one of our kids or one of our loved ones. It could have been anybody. So the community hurts. And I'm still carrying a, a piece, a little piece of that hurt on my shoulder for you guys. So thank you for being here. Okay. And I also want to recognize Katie Reeves from our Fulton County School Board. Thank you for being here. So it's, uh, it's my pleasure this time I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Jason Howard. And uh, many of you know Jason from his role at Stone Creek Church here in Milton, where he serves as Stone Creek's care pastor. Jason completed his Master's of Art in Clinical Mental Health Counseling from Richmond Graduate University, and he is an associate therapist with the Summit Counseling Center. At Summit, Jason specializes in working with people struggling with grief and loss, like transitions and relationship health, as well as people who might be dealing with spirituality issues, depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. Jason is also special to the city of Milton as he serves as our public safety chaplain for the Milton Police Department and the Milton Fire and Rescue Department. Please join me in, wel in a warm welcome to, wel or in a, giving a warm welcome to Jason Howard, who will introduce us to our panelists tonight's discussion. And I want to announce to um, Commissioner Bob Ellis, Fulton County Commissioner, is here too. So thank you for being here, Bob. Great. Well, thank you, Mayor. I think my mom's watching online, so she should be really proud right now <laughs> at your introduction. You know, as stated before, I uh, just want to welcome everybody that's here in the room as well as online. Uh, we are live streaming this from City Hall this evening. And so uh, for those of you that are joining us here and also online, this is a wonderful opportunity uh, for us to join with people not just around uh, our city, but also around the nation and the world and having a conversation about how we can uh, become more aware of ways to prevent and to end uh, suicides in our homes and in our communities. So thank you guys for taking the brave step of being able to join us here and also for those of you online. Um, we are going to also be recording tonight's event, and so we're going to make it available on the city's website in probably the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, so if you hear something tonight and you don't share it, it will be a huge missed opportunity. We have a wonderful panel. We have a lot of questions that we've already prepared and worked with the panel. And there's a lot of things that we have put in place to help start this conversation. And it can continue by you sharing and reviewing this uh, broadcast um, after this evening. And so we would love for you guys to be able to do that. Also, we have a resource table that will be available. Um, there are a list of resources, both from the Summit Counseling Center as well as um, Fulton County Schools. would love for you guys to stop by and pick up some of the resources. Not only are there resources about uh, suicide awareness and prevention, but there's also resources um, for some upcoming trainings that we'll talk about a little bit more um, towards the end of this evening. Um, and then just want to let you guys know a little bit about tonight's focus and also the fact that you'll be able to ask questions. You can ask questions by going to Summit Counseling's Facebook page. And if you look down on the bottom of the Facebook page, there's a place there to direct message. If you'll send your question through the direct message, you can do that here in the room or also online. Um, that will actually go to our therapist to be able to then take that and get that question directly to me, and we'll be able to ask that to our panelists. Um, but also, if you're here in the room and you'd like to ask a question, there are cards out here at our table. At any time, if you're close to the door and you'd like to uh, step out and um, put a question on one of the cards, or if you'll just raise your hand in the room, one of the city staff will be able to come around. They'll be able to give you a card, and then they'll be able to take that card and get it out to the table, and the table will be able to make sure that we get that question um, to me. That'll be the last, probably about 20, 25 minutes of the conversation. Again, we have a lot of questions um, this, this evening. The main goal um, for today is really uh, kind of threefold. The first thing we want to do is we want to talk about support. How do we, as a community, support one another after a loss? After there's been a death by suicide, how do we as a community know what it looks like to be able to support one another in that moment 
and ongoing. The second thing, though, that we want to do is we want to um, talk with our panelists about a, a better understanding of the statistics and community health aspect of suicidal desperation to kind of come out of the darkness and reduce the stigma to be able to really have an open and honest conversation. And then the third thing that we want to be able to do tonight is to find ways to empower one another and to leave here with something that can actually help us in the latest thinking and resources to bring awareness and prevention to suicide. And so you guys, again, are really a part of something very important. And again, let's give a big round of applause to our panelists. For being here. I know the panelists are in your program, but those uh, online don't may maybe have a program. So I just want to go through uh, a little bit of background about who is here. Um, first, we have uh, Megan Barfield. Megan's a school-based therapist in several of our Milton uh, area middle and high schools. Um, she's also at the Summit Counseling uh, Milton office. She focuses on treating anxiety and depression and also helping students navigate self-worth issues and life transition. Um, you guys will like to know she's a UGA graduate. Um, a Bachelor of Science in Human Development and Family Sciences, and a Master of Science in Marriage and Family Therapy from the University of Southern Mississippi. We also have next to her Sean Curry. Sean is the Associate Student Director at Stone Creek Church, and he works primarily with students and young adults from middle school through college. He's a Melton resident, and he's experienced firsthand the effects of suicide and what it can have on a school and also our community. Um, that experience is a big part of why he chose to serve students who struggle with anxiety, depression, and also suicidal desperation. And he's currently pursuing a master's degree in divinity from Liberty University. Uh, next to Sean is uh, Dr. Jan Gorniak. Jan is the chief medical examiner for Fulton County, and she received her doctorate in osteopathic medicine, and she's certified by the American Board of Pathology in Anatomic and Forensic Pathology. Dr. Gornak is a registered uh, medical-legal death investigator through the American Board of Medical-legal Death Investigators, and she's committed not only to investigation, uh, but I love that she's also to the prevention of death, especially when it comes to suicide, heroin abuse, infant mortality, and violence. And then next to her is Dr. Ronald Magat, who's a psychiatrist specializing in anxiety, depression, and mood disorders among children, adolescents, and adults in the North Fulton and Forsyth areas. He's a graduate of the Morehouse Medical School and the University of Hawaii um, for general pediatrics. He's also uh, received subspecialty training at Emory University for uh, medicine and general psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry. And then we have Chelsea Montgomery. Chelsea is the Executive Director of Counseling, Psychological, and Social Work for our Fulton County School System. She's earned her graduate certificate in Applied Behavioral Analysis from Penn State and completed an Educational Specialist degree in School Psychology from UT Chattanooga. She's also got on-the-ground experience as a classroom teacher, an interventionist, and a school psychologist. Now, along with those panelists, we have and two of our parents who are with us this evening. You know, best practice as we looked for uh, the city of Milton is for communities to engage with those who have lived experience of losing a child to death by suicide or experiencing suicide. A best practice for communities is to engage them and seek out and hear from them as their insights can be extremely valuable to improve our care, to enhance our safety, and to improve support for lost survivors. So tonight we're going to have a chance to hear from, uh, next to me, Britt Bean, who's a wife and a mother of two girls and two boys who lost her oldest son, Reagan, at 14 years old to suicide. And while she now resides in Prosper, Texas, Britt has a lot of Milton in her heart, where she was a resident from 2005 to 2015. And since being in Prosper, she's worked with many survivor groups with the hope of sharing that while tragedy can happen to anyone, talking about suicide saves lives rather than causes more people to end their life by suicide. And next to Brit is Laura Lynn Mustaki, who's a wife and a mother of two boys and a girl who lost that girl daughter to Ivy, uh, Ivy at 18 years old to suicide. Laura Lynn and her husband, they still reside in Milton. And one of her main desires is to get people to talk about suicide, to confront it, to deal with it, and do whatever we can to prevent it. And so again, let's give our panel a round of applause. Well, 
Katie Reeves, I'm glad you showed up because I was excited to see such a big turnout tonight and I thought someone might have mistakenly posted that this was a school redistricting meeting. <laughs> so, uh, just like we're passionate about those types of things because they change our kids' lives, we need to be more passionate about these types of things because they can save our kids' lives. So, it can happen to anyone for any reason and my story supports that fact. When we left Chicago in 2005, we were looking for the perfect place to raise our four children. Great schools, great neighborhoods, great community. Milton wasn't even a city when we moved here, but quickly grew into the place to be. With that, the pressure on kids grew. Grades, sports, social media, and popularity. My son, Reagan, <laughs> somehow knew everyone at his school and all the other schools. He was happy, kind, and loved by kids and teachers alike. Well, most teachers, because he was kind of a class clown. Okay, brand. <laughs> December 13th, 2013. Friday the 13th in a full moon, and I could not have said all the bad things that happened into motion, even if I tried. Reagan was a 14-year-old freshman trying to be cool. He had some friends over after school when I was out of town and his 20-year-old sister was babysitting. Another kid, not at my house, called the police and made a report about underage drinking and illegal drug use happening in my front yard. The reality was that the boys had snuck a couple of girls in beer into my basement and were trying not to get caught by big sister upstairs. When the police officer got to my quiet house at eight o'clock that night, he didn't notice anything wrong and followed voices he heard coming from my neighbor's backyard. They were outside and they confirmed everything was fine. As he was walking back to his car, he heard someone by my basement door and saw a beer can. This is when everything went downhill. When the officer knocked on the basement door to announce his presence, the kids ran upstairs to tell my daughter, while others ran into the creek behind my house. The officers chased those running away, fell, and hurt himself. After my daughter let the officer into my home and the kids and parents gathered, the environment became toxic, and a simple lesson learned situation escalated into four hours of shouting, threats, and the kids being charged with obstruction of justice and MIP. This moment became the worst thing that had ever happened to Reagan. No kid, parent, or officer could have dreamed that something like this could turn into such an out-of-control situation. I'm sure Reagan was worried what I would think and do, even though all I could think was he's learned his lesson the hard way and the rest of high school will be a breeze. But he didn't know what I was thinking, and I'm sure he was scared and kept thinking over and over how much his dad and I would be disappointed in him. I also think Reagan was scared that he'd ruined his friends' lives. After getting in trouble, would they still be able to play sports or get into the right college? He was worried what everyone at church would think, since he was recently baptized and it convinced many of his friends to start attending youth group. He was worried what everyone would say on Instagram, Snapchat, and at school. He was embarrassed. He was worried what all the neighbors would think about his family and panicked that it might even be in the Milton Herald. Somehow, in all these worries and the broken record playing in his head of how bad this was, he didn't know it would all be fine the next day. That night, my son Reagan died by suicide. We all have those little voices in our head, almost like the old cartoons that show the devil on one shoulder and the an angel on the other. I know Reagan definitely had a little devil telling him earlier in the night, come on, man, you'll be fine. Your friends will think you're cool, and dude, you're in your basement. It's only a few friends, it's not a wild party, and your sister's upstairs just in case. That voice must have changed from mischievous to mean, and I think all Reagan could hear was that he was bad, stupid, and had done something unforgivable. Part of the note he left said he was sorry to the friends he had led down the wrong track. He also said, I feel I've made a mistake that none of my family should go through, and I believe I don't belong here for that reason. He truly believed in his 14-year-old mind that he was solving the problem and somehow helping us, that we would be better off without him because that terrible voice kept telling him that this was the only solution and the only way out of that pain. That night, the mean voice became so loud, it erased 14 years of us telling Reagan we would always love him, no matter what. And there was nothing he could ever do to change that. 
My purpose for sharing tonight is for us to be able to talk openly and honestly about suicide so that we all, no matter what our age, can in that moment remember that suicidal thoughts lie and that there are always other options and ways to survive our pain. Tonight, I want us to hear different voices from our community that speak of so many other options, parents, schools, churches, counselors, peers, and the entire city have to all be vested in helping. The saying, it takes a village, is so true in the case of suicide prevention because it will take us all working together to make sure that a good, positive voice is the only one our children are able to hear, and it keeps telling them that everything will be okay. So uh, every 12 minutes, a U.S. citizen will die by suicide. Suicide is the second leading cause of death. For ages 15 to 24... And believe it or not, twice as many people will die of suicide than homicide. Yet this deadly crisis is a silent subject. Suicide is a quiet killer, and why? Expert and teens cite spotty mental health, screening, or poor mental services. Consider the constant scroll of social media showing perfect lives every day. Teens bullying on social media. An adolescent brain is not fully developed until 25. This allows for more risky behaviors in moments without thinking consequences through. In dark moments, adolescents may find life so traumatic that suicide seems like an option. And because teens interact in a way that not always are face-to-face, there's less connection and more isolation. When a friend withdraws, teens don't know what to do. I'm here as the mother of a beautiful daughter, Ivy Lee Mastaki. She was born in Buckhead, June 28, 1999. And she died by suicide in Milton, Georgia, March 16th, 2018. I saw Ivy grow from a precious baby to a vibrant young woman. She was someone who brought us so much joy, and her absence leaves a void we will never get over. I'm telling her story in hopes that others having issues they think are inescapable will choose life over death. I would like to begin by sharing a story with you about Ivy from a friend back in 2008 when they were in second grade at Summit Hill. I actually didn't know this story, and the first time I heard it was at Ivy's uh, service. But this was her friend speaking. So sitting in class, Ivy's friend really had to use the restroom. Their classroom was outside in trailers. So to get inside of the bathroom, you had to take a buddy and the teacher's key. Ivy's friend was nervous to interrupt the teacher from talking, so she waited and waited and waited. Finally, when the teacher finished, she grabbed Ivy and the key and rushed out the door to the bathroom. On the way, they realized they took the wrong key from the classroom. Ivy ran back to the classroom to get the right key, but by the time she made it back, it was too late. Her friend had an accident. Her friend, being completely mortified and too embarrassed, said she was going to stay in the bathroom for the rest of the day. Ivy, being a friend, came up with the idea to switch pants. Ivy walked back into the classroom in front of everyone and told the teacher she wet her pants. Sitting here today, who, who do you know would do that for your second grade friend? That's who Ivy was. Ivy loved cheerleading, and she cheered on the varsity high uh, high school team since ninth grade. She loved apples and socks and free people. She danced and played softball and soccer. Excuse me. 
Whoops. She swam on the white column swim team for over eight years. And she received the President's Education Award for Outstanding Academic Excellence for three years and was on the National Honor Society. She volunteered at Cambridge in high, in high school and Stone Creek and North Fulton Charities. She even mentored a special needs student and befriended a beautiful girl named Katie. Katie brought, Ivy brought Katie in her inner circle and on the high school varsity cheer team. Ivy's smile was so infectious, so what went wrong? Ivy was the victim of a sexual assault, a secret she harbored from her parents but confided with a few friends what had happened. Ivy had many girlfriends, but over the course of a year, Ivy's friendship splintered. Some of her friends betrayed her. Ivy physically began showing signs that something was wrong and her behavior was off. Ivy was losing her confidence and interest in cheerleading and other activities. She had little enthusiasm and wasn't sleeping or eating regularly. Ivy was severely depressed. We took her to the doctor for tests. It was MRIs, EEG, blood work, scans, but nothing, according to the test results, nothing was medically wrong and there were no drugs in her system. During that doctor's visit, Ivy finally told us about the sexual assault. Ivy had felt alone and was suppressing this pain, which caused the PTSD. My husband and I were doing everything we could to get her the help she needed. We talked to her and supported her and loved her. All the while, we struggled as parents with how does a senior in Milton High School get diagnosed with PTSD? Ivy attempted suicide, and my husband and I were there to intervene. We checked her into a facility specializing in mental health issues and addiction. If you've dealt with the medical community, you know how it feels to put your faith in medical experts. You trust them to find the medical answers and treat the patient. You trust them, and Ivy was treated by a doctor who prescribed three very powerful medications, two antidepressants and an antipsychotic. These medications brought about many side effects for Ivy, including suicide thoughts. All three medications had a black box warning, which we learned is the strictest warning for potentially causing serious hazards like suicide thoughts. Ivy went through the treatment program and seemed a little better, but she was still off. She returned to school where rumors spread about her treatment. Ivy noticed classmates avoiding her and more friends kept their distance. All the while, we were determined to see her get better. Ivy began seeing a new therapist, and we scheduled a visit with another psychologist to reduce her medications. We thought Ivy was getting better, but she wasn't. I believe the pain of life had gotten too much. For our daughter... I believe Ivy did not want to take her life. She wanted the pain in her head to go away. Ivy, Ivy school closed the day of her service and over 1,200 people came. A bright light in the world has gone out. So we must speak about suicide openly and honestly. Suicide cannot be an option because it's a final one. We must reduce the stigma, the shame, the guilt of depression and mental illness. Sometimes dark thoughts are beyond our control. With open discussions, we can walk through these dark hours and get the help we need. Most importantly, we must surround those in need with family and friends. We must move in and not move out. We must teach kids and teens that sexual assaults need to be reported when they happen. I wonder what could have been different had we known sooner a year and a half. We could have helped her. We must empower our sons and daughters to speak up. 
In addition, we need to educate ourselves about post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and mental health issues. It's real in suburban America. If we see a friend struggling, showing unusual behavior, be compassionate because we may not know what they're going through. We need to be there for each other. Avoiding someone when they're in pain or going through a rough time is hurtful and it hurts the person in pain. We must reduce the overprescribing of powerful psychotic drugs. We need to question the doctors we put our faith in and work with them to understand the treatment paths they are sending their young patients on and fully understand the dangers they may encounter. Lastly, for families left behind from a death of suicide, the grief is inconceivable. It never goes away. Sometimes it's difficult to make it through the day because I have so much love for Ivy. But that is how deep my grief is. Since her death, I have learned that we have two choices. We can decide to let this grief take over our life and take us down, or we can try to choose life. It will take time, but we can do it for our remaining family and friends and eventually for ourselves. Slowly, we'll try to find the light back in our lives. And I also just wanted to say a thank you for those that helped contribute to an honor, an uh, arbor that we are building in Ivy's honor in a Milton Park. Um, Slowly, we're moving towards construction. So I just want to thank you, whoever helped support us for that. Thank you. Yeah. So, Britt and Laura Lynn, thank you guys for doing the hard thing of sharing your stories with us and honoring us with your stories. Um, you both mentioned how hard it's been. And so talking about the support side and the grieving side, can you share with us a little bit what were some of the things that helped you over these years to be able to, to grieve well and the support from the community that you received, what were the things that helped the most? Well, food. Thank you. Everyone brought food, so that's always wonderful. <laughs> but with suicide, it's different because it scares people. And I think, you know, I, I felt very supported here in Milton. I had such an outpouring of support and care and love from everybody here because it was just so out of the blue and out of the ordinary. And I think it was more hard on myself because other people might not be thinking this, but in my head I was like, okay, they're here supporting me and my child chose this. And I think that's kind of a recurring theme in my healing was getting past <laughs> the fact that, you know, he didn't die of cancer. He didn't, you know, catch, get struck by a car. You know, it's that he chose, you know, to end his life. Whereas if, you know, you get sick or something, you're not choosing that. It chooses you. So I think, you know, people are just scared because they don't know why it happens. And we still don't know why. We know a lot of different contributing factors to it. But I think just being there and, like you said, leaning in and not running away. Um, and uh, there's really, I think it's just being there for your friends and making sure, you know, there's, everybody's scared they're going to say the wrong thing. That's why everybody brings food, because at least it shows you care and you're being supportive. So, it, but, um, you know, just being there in case Someone needs to talk to you. And, and the weird thing, and yes, I'm weird, don't be strong for me. Like, cry. And I, I can't even tell you the, the overwhelming peace it brought me to see all the people coming and crying for me. It was a true, honest, genuine thing that I felt that they were trying to take some of my pain from me. So... Don't try and be strong for me. I just know when you cried for me, it helped me not cry. So, Well, for, um, for me, I would probably really say it was my faith and my family and my friends. I mean, the people in Milton, they were amazing. Um, 
people came together for us and people that we didn't know were there for us. And, you know, we received cards and letters and flowers. And, and I know that people prayed and, and that prayer power works. It really works. Um, but, um, I mean, it's just something we will always live with. This is our, this is our life. I'm not ashamed of it. This is what happened to us. This is what happened to Ivy's life. I love when people talk about Ivy. I'm still in touch with a lot of her friends, and they text me, and I love that. Um, and we still talk about Ivy. I mean, Ivy will, she'll never go away. So, um, you know, I think sometimes I don't have a stigma. I'm, like I said, I'm not ashamed. But if sometimes if people saw me, they would turn away from the grocery store. Well, I, my head's going up higher because this is something that can happen to anybody. Yeah, Sean Laura Lynn mentioned that, you know, people that knew Ivy, I know you knew both Ivy and Reagan. Um, do you want to add anything about some of the support side from the students that you work with and talk to? Yeah, I would say, first of all, um, it is okay to acknowledge how heartbreaking suicide is. Um, it's okay to acknowledge how much hurt there is um, with friends and families and even communities of those who've gone through death by suicide. Um, you know, even if there are people who didn't know them directly, um, they're still affected. I went to Cambridge High School, um, and when, when Reagan died by suicide, uh, it was devastating for our entire school, and there's people who didn't even know him, um, but... I think that it's so, first of all, it's okay to acknowledge um, how heartbreaking it is. And the second thing I would say is that we want to create a space for the friends and the family and the community of those affected by suicide, uh, a safe place um, to process, but also safe people to process with. Um, and so I think I work, I work at Stone Creek Church and um, with both the Mustakis and the Beans, it's been, it was um, I mean, an honor to be able to be a part of creating that place to process, um, for them to process with. But also, um, like, like Britt talked about, I think that we need to be people who can laugh with them and cry with them and hurt with them um, and hug them and be there for them. Um, I, I love your language of leaning in instead of pulling away. I think that is, that is so important in these moments. So. You know, Chelsea, um, talking at this point about students, can you give us a little insight into the school side and the support that goes on within our schools when we know that a teen or student has died by suicide? So first, I can see everyone really tense. I'm going to be a little teacher and a little psychologist for a minute. I need everybody to breathe. <laughs> we, we have to be able to talk about this. If it's, if it's that scary and it makes us that nervous, you won't leave here talking about it. So wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes a little bit. We, we, we have to have this conversation, and we have to be okay and in a safe space to have that conversation. Um, those are the hardest days of my job, without a doubt, and I hope I never have another one. That's why we need these events. So after, after a student or faculty member dies by suicide, it happens to our adults as well in our communities. We come together as a school system, not as a school we support the schools. We put as many counselors, psychologists, social workers as we need available that next day. We pull them from everywhere, and that's okay. We'll pull them for as many days as we need them to be there. It is an ongoing process. It's not just the day after. It's not just the week of. We intentionally make sure that things are in the works for the months or semesters or years to come if they need to be. Um, a couple little kind of things that we don't always think about. The parents always want to step in. This is little, but it's huge. They need to be fed. We're sad too. The care teams that are coming are also having a very rough day. The best thing you can do is feed them. I know it's little, but I know the PTAs call. I know the SGCs call. That, that's, that's the best thing that we can do. And just know that we're sad too. And those are really, really hard days. Those aren't typically students that I have daily interactions with, but I own it and I take it very personally. We all do. We all own those kids. We all own every kid in our county. And also being sensitive to memorials. I know it's rough. Um, we, we are very well versed in the research around both permanent and temporary memorials. Please trust us. Please trust us that we know the decisions that we're making are the best for your kids. But we really, we, we, 
we gather around that next day and for as many days after as we can and do everything we can. Every, everything stops on those days and I'm completely okay with that. I, I, I call my, my secretary and say, wipe my calendar for the week. Whatever we gotta do, we, we, we gotta get it done. So bringing together a safe place for kids to be together, for them to be talking. We don't want anyone quiet on those days. We need a lot of talking. If they're quiet and there aren't kids in the halls, we're gonna go to the classrooms. What's everybody talking about? What's happening? So we, we will figure it out, but we, those, those are intense days and I hope we don't ever have another one. Thank you. Is it okay sometimes too to see kids talking one moment, crying the next moment, <laughs> laughing the next moment? And not think that that's weird. That yes, okay. um, absolutely. And they're teenagers. Um, but a lot, and you would be surprised those days. We also set up a completely different space for adults to come to, and we we get a lot of adult visitors. So adults don't come to the same spaces as kids. We do separate those because we want them to have a safe space as well. We don't know what they're going through, so we we want to support our adults just as much as our kids. But yes, all we we receive extensive training, and we call it, we call it restoration. So doing the best we can to get kids back to a place of their new normal as quickly and safely and responsibly as we can. So that's what we really work on with the kids. And yes, you'll, you kind of see it in their little groups that they're in. You'll hear one group laughing while another group is very upset. And sometimes that gets a little, a little sticky, but that's just that process of, of coming back and being safe and that's okay. Yeah, and Megan, I know, so we're talking a lot about students, but this is a, it's a community issue. And so from an adult standpoint, family members, neighbors, um, what would you say we can also do in order to help support and be there for someone who's lost a loved one that, that's not a student? Maybe it is someone that's, that's older. Um, I think the first thing, it's already kind of been said a few times, is to not be afraid of it. And I think sometimes we even will use language that shows we're afraid of it. And so just being open with it. And I think also asking what type of support do you need? That's a big thing I hear from um, like my emerging adult, like right out of high school college students is people are trying to support me, but it doesn't feel that way to me. And I know they're coming from a good place, but I'm overwhelmed now. And so just asking like, what do you need from me today? or how can I be there for you is such a big impact because it may be sitting there with them and like we've said, laughing and crying with them. It may be a meal um, and it may just be some space for them to process with their families. And so I think just being open about that. Yeah, and, and Dr. Gornick, I know we heard from, gosh, Laurelyn and, and Brett, both of you guys, that it's different that when someone dies by suicide, the, the motion is different within cancer or another maybe type of, of death. Can you speak to that? Like, is there something that we should know and how to support someone from this? I'm helping your space here. So obviously I'm, I'm speaking with, with the family members. So what I see when they come to me is the why um, and they want questions, which unfortunately I don't have that answer, but it's also um, guilt and anger. Um, some, the guilt is I missed something, um, or the anger is that you don't know my child. You can't tell me this is how my child died. So they get angry. And sometimes it's difficult for me to have that conversation because I have my doctor hat on. Um, so I sometimes have to take my doctor hat off and just be Jan and not Dr. Gorniak, just be Jan and just I try to say that you're right. This was your child that I don't know, that you know them, you knew how they were. And unfortunately for me, this is, I'm the scientist with the evidence in, in front of me, but it's okay for them to know their child the way they know their child. Um, so I'll take that anger. Um, they can be angry at me, but I think the anger and the guilt is more what I see from, from family members because they think they miss something. Right. Does anybody else want to speak to that, especially maybe the missed? Yeah, I'll, I'll add a little bit to that with, um, with students, too. Um, my experience walking with students who have gone through um, um, grieving from losing a friend with suicide, from suicide, um, they experience extreme guilt as well. Um, and it can be guilt from, uh, from somebody who was their best friend all the way to somebody who's never known them. And I've, I've noticed that a lot of students will ask questions um, 
to themselves a lot, but also to people when they're processing of, I, I remember this encounter I had with that person who died. If I would have done this, maybe they still would have been here. Or if I would have said this, maybe my friend wouldn't have died by suicide. And I think um, that is important for us to know in these moments. I think it's important for us to be able to keep an open dialogue with that. And just like with family and friends, um, not be afraid to lean in in those hard conversations and say, hey, how are are you processing this? How are you dealing with this? How can we get you help? Um, because even if you have a son or a daughter who goes to a school of somebody who um, dies by suicide and you know they didn't know them, that doesn't mean that they aren't dealing with some kind of guilt. And so I think it's important to lean in there too. Yeah. So I, I want to transition this to the mental health side and understanding of suicide because we're talking a lot about how we talk with people. Um, so Megan... When we're talking with, with someone, and this also anybody else on the panel, what do we say and what do we also maybe steer away from when we're talking about suicide? Um, I think the main thing we steer away from is the word death or die. That just feels really harsh. And I think um, even with, like I said earlier, the language we've used, um, completed and committed suicide, and that's changing a lot now. You'll hear more die by suicide because the language we use really alludes to things that we don't realize. Committed can be compared to committing a crime, and that's not what this is. Um, and I think saying die by suicide is really objective, and that's what we need to be to address it. Like Chelsea said, we have to be really comfortable with this to talk about it to prevent it. Um, and so that's mostly what we see are those words that kind of steer away from it. You go right around it, um, and it's not at the heart of the issue. And, you know, Dr. Gornag, you just, I think, completed within the last year uh, research study looking also at the myths of suicide. Um, what are some of the biggest maybe myths and misconceptions about suicide that you've identified through the study? Um, there's quite a few. Um, most people were surprised that most people die by suicide with firearms. Um, that and it was the reason we looked at it, let me go back. The reason we looked at it is because as forensic pathologists, we're, we were just trained about why or women don't die by suicide. They, we want to be nice and clean. We're not going to leave a mess. But where do these myths come from? Do people really believe that? And so we, asked, we went out and asked the public, what, what, are, what do you think? Um, most people thought that both men and women died by um, pills. Um, there were overdoses. Um, but like I said, most were um, firearms. Um, another myth was African-Americans don't hang themselves because of the, the, the connection with lynching. Black people do hang themselves. Um, the youngest person, um, I was surprised that they would say that, um, we said tweens don't, don't die by suicide. Um, and the community was like age 11. Um, the youngest I had was eight. When I trained in 2005, we, I mean, if they were 12 or younger, that wasn't even part of the conversation. Um, but we have to look at the, the circumstances, and this eight-year-old used those words. I'm going to kill myself, um, and we don't believe it, uh, you know me. And I, I, I remember one of the cases I had where it was a, you know, 12, 13-year-old boy who got caught shoplifting. Um, his mother went and picked him up. And I can just picture the conversation. Now, you go to your room and you sit and think about what you did, da 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 da, da right? And, um, and then when dad came home, they went, they found him hanging in his bedroom. So then I, I changed the way I disciplined my own kids. <laughs> um, you go to your room and then five minutes later, you come sit right next to me. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> because, I mean, you learn what, what stressors are, you know what I mean? And so that was uh, another, that, you know, depression. Everybody is depressed or everybody is on um, medication. Um, but we also learned that the, there's different, quote-unquote, reasons that we, that we would see. Um, and so in the younger ones, it was um, relationship. Um, um, as it went to the, I think the, the oldest person was like 98 years old. Um, it becomes like health issues or financial financial um, issues. So those were um, 
most of them that the young people don't um, firearms women they use firearms to um, let me see anything oh holidays right there there is no rhyme or reason I think when we looked at it, it was July was the highest month I don't know I mean so it's not like around the holidays that the, the rates go up yeah. Yeah, I'd like to add um, two things. One, um, when it comes to disciplining kids, I don't have kids, so I'm not going to tell you what to do. But one thing we do see is this whole conversation is about talking. When you take away a cell phone, if their friends are their safe space, if our text line is their safe space, that's very scary. So just a tidbit about the cell phone. Not telling you how to do it, but <laughs> we've seen it. So please just be mindful of that. Um, also... With means, unsecured firearms, the, the statistics aren't good. So that, I mean, it's a hard conversation. It's a political conversation, but I'm going to put it out there. And in addition, in honor of Mr. Ellis's opioid recovery evening this evening, um, pills, pills are easily accessible. Um, they, they might be secured in your house. They might not be secured in their grandparents' house over the holidays. We see a lot of that. We see a lot of January. I get very, very nervous about kids going to grandparents' houses. And, and you know, grandparents' medicine cabinets, they're, they're not counting them. Um, or aunts or friends or relatives or uncles or at the other houses that they're in. If they go to the bathroom, they have access. So you may be being very responsible about it, but I need you to think about the other places that your kids are going as well. Those drug take-back days are really critical. We need to get rid of what we don't need. Yeah, so that point, um, so the lethality, that's a word that we use a lot kind of in clinical assessments. What, to keep people safe, thoughts on guidelines around lethality and means and taking away some of those things that could keep people safe, what would you guys recommend? Any thoughts on that? Well, I, I agree when we talk about um, locking your, your, your firearms up. Um, I, I say that that's one way, right? And then so the second leading cause is, is hanging. Um, you can't take away every belt, every cord, every, you know what I mean? So um, it's, it, it's difficult, you know what I mean? But if there's, if there's a, a way or a, a method, and I think when we talk about talking about it, you know, that's one of the, the questions, you know. Do you have a means? You know, do you have a plan? Um, and then to keep it talking so then you're you're aware of it. And like you said, know what's in other people's houses, you know, know where who their friends are and what their friends' houses are are, are like. But I think um from where I sit, it it can be anything. Can I add something? Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanted to say something about about access. Uh, when you're talking about suicide, it's a very kind of complex event. It can't be boiled down to this is what caused this person to, to die by suicide. It's this complex combination of different factors. If you want to look at it like a, a, a lock with this combination, and it, every dial has to be put in just right for the event to happen. Um, so, and we're going to probably talk about risk factors in a little bit, but there are also, as what we're talking about is access to things where there's an opportunity where a child or a person who is vulnerable uh, to, to suicide uh, might, you know, be walking across the hallway, say a child who, who sees the gun cabinet and is already upset and distressed to begin with and sees that access as something, okay, this is how I'm going to solve, solve the problem here, or goes to the, uh, the medicine cabinet and sees, sees some pills when they weren't even looking for the pills in the first place. They just happen to be in a very vulnerable state, uh, depressed, uh, upset about something, a breakup perhaps, uh, leading to that, that particular situation happening. And that's, I think, an important thing to understand. It's, uh, if a person wants to commit suicide, uh, you could have people uh, committing suicide or uh, attempting suicide in, in units that are locked, uh, their, their shoelaces are taken away, their belts are taken away, and they still find a means to do so. Uh, so I think uh, that conversation in terms of trying to keep a home safe or, or trying to make sure that uh, houses that, that, that people who are vulnerable uh, visit, you can't take care of everything, but 
but shore up those areas that, that can be avenues of opportunity for someone who you know is vulnerable that can have access to these, these, these things. So. Um, Dr. McGuff, sticking with you for a second. Um, you know, we heard a second ago, someone says something, right? I just want to kill myself or I wish I'd run around or wouldn't wake up. I mean, as a psychiatrist, out psychiatrist, I mean, what, what do you take seriously? What would you recommend for us to kind of learn and to be just aware of? And, and then how do we take those statements or comments? Okay. Um, well, first, I, I want to apologize because sometimes I use old language and I just caught myself in saying commit. And I think that that's a very, uh, uh, that's a very powerful word to use in terms mm -hmm. of because people commit crimes. And when you say people commit suicide, it's, it's kind of in that same vein. And I, I just wanted to emphasize that. Uh, but I, I kind of get caught into using that, that old language too. So I apologize if, 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 if that comes across. Uh, but in answer to your question, Jason, about what do you do when someone comes forward um, voicing uh, what we call suicidal ideation language, that is pointing towards a person who might be in imminent danger of, of hurting themselves, you take it seriously, right? Uh, you don't see it as, and, and this is what I see a lot of, of parents who come into my office who dismiss what their child is going through as, oh, it's just they want attention, or they're saying that to get their cell phone back, or because they're grounded and they're just trying to threaten me or manipulate me to, to do those things. And that's a very dangerous precedent to have when it comes to someone, a loved one, uh, who is voicing a lot of internal distress. And when we're talking about kids who come and, and come forth and, and talk about a, uh, um, I'm so upset and I want to kill myself, uh, that is a... Um, uh, a lack of, of seeing other ways of handling that distress. Um, so it needs to be taken seriously. It doesn't mean that you, you drive them to the emergency room, but you sit down and you have a talk with them and give it that, that particular expression of distress it's, it's due. Um, so so that, that would be a starting point when it comes to you know, someone coming forward with, with suicides. You take, you take it seriously. Can I ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> so what do you say? I mean, so as a parent, and my child is saying this, and you're saying, take it seriously, how do I sit down and say, stop? I mean, what do you, what, what do you say? Yeah. Uh, it is, it also depends on the particular, the particular situation, right? Uh, when you're talking about young kids, young kids uh, is a very rare phenomenon in terms of young kids, like five to 11 years of age, to, uh, to attempt suicide or to die by suicide. I think the statistics are like one in a million. But you'll see and you'll hear kids talk about, I want to kill myself. So you ask, well, is there any other language or is there something else that you're wanting to mean other than, than, than saying something like that? I know that you're, uh, you're upset. I can see it. I know that this is what the situation is, is, is very uh, upsetting for you. Uh, let's talk about it. Um, let's find out why you're upset, rather than addressing and, and kind of freaking out because your child is saying something like, I want to die. I mean, we've, I mean my kid has, has, has said that too when they're upset. I just oh, I want to kill myself or something like that when it came to uh, messing up. or We probably said that ourselves too. Uh, it's not that uh, you, you dismiss it, but you, you take something like that seriously and you, you give the distress a voice and an accurate way of describing feelings um, rather than sort of invalidating what they're going through in terms of their emotions and, and what they're feeling. No, you don't really feel that way. Or no, you don't really want to hurt yourself. You don't want to kill yourself. That's stupid. That's foolish. Don't say anything like that. I know you just want your cell phone back or I know you just want to, you know, just, uh, you, want, you want me to feel guilty or something like that. Um, that kind of language can certainly lend itself to, well, I'll, I'll show you then. You know, I'll up the ante here, and I'll show you what I can do. And then it becomes a, a test of wills that can reach these kind of escalated dangerous levels. I, I, was, I was just going to add, we did talk to Ivy about suicide. I mean, we had that conversation, and we talked to her about sexual assault when she was 11 years old. So those are conversations we had with our kids. And um, for Ivy, I would just say we did not know how deep the pain was. 
uh, that was probably what my husband and I missed. We just, you know, she just totally withdrew and she just went into her head. And when she was around us, she would try to show her light. But we did not know how deep that pain was. And um, we got help. We sought the therapist. We sought the psychiatrist. We, I mean, my husband and I really, we walked through. I was calling my sons. What about this? I think this is going on. I think that's happening. Where should we take her? What should we do? Um, I just think so many things happened to her at a, over the course of a year and a half, but then towards the last three months, um, it was just too much. And we didn't know what that young mind was trying to bear in her head. And we just didn't know. And I'm telling you, if we didn't know, it's, it's a mental health is a, is a, is a very much of an unknown. And as much as we did talk to Ivy and sit down and, and we were getting around the clock care. I mean, you know, but, um, so I just wanted to point that out that we went through a lot of that. Um, I was just going to say, so we hear these things in the school system, as you can imagine, you hear them at home. We hear them at school. We take them critically serious. If anything, we may take them a little too far. If a second grader for kindergartner says this, doesn't matter. We go through a full crisis protocol. We come out with a result. You will find out. You will be informed. Um, if we do five in a month on the same student, so be it. We won't stop. So when we hear those comments, regardless of age, regardless of number of times, we take them extremely serious every single time. So you can feel confident that if your child is expressing these, um, voicing these things in school, you, you will know. Yeah, and so uh, one of the things, Laura, that I think, Laura Lynn, I think you just mentioned this, complexity, that it's very complex. And I hear a lot of things that are going on. I want to dive into just a couple of them from the mental health aspect, because there are things that we can do from an assessment side of things and also from an ongoing treatment standpoint that I know you guys said that you walked through. One of the things that you mentioned, though, was the assault and the PTSD side of things. Um, Dr. McGowan or Megan, um, would you guys help us understand the impact that things like trauma, abuse, domestic violence, even things like neglect can have in the brain when we're starting to, to work with someone or, or talk with someone about kind of their mental health and then. I can certainly speak to how trauma really affects a uh, person's ability to cope, uh, to uh, emotionally regulate. Um, uh, when it comes to um, events uh, where uh, there's a, a fear for one's life uh, or an experience where one has been a witness to, to violence or been exposed to violence, uh, it leads to these architectural changes in the brain, and, and maybe Dr. Gorniak can speak to this too, uh, where you have different pathways that open up, even at the genetic level. There's this field called epigenetics, where genes are turned on in response to these environmental stressors that happen. Um, you have also this, this increased uh, stress response, the fight or flight system, which a lot of you might be familiar with, uh, where that's an ongoing constant thing, depending on uh, if you have, say, ongoing PTSD, uh, if you are in an environment, uh, say, an inner city, or if you are uh, in a household where there is frequent uh, conflict, domestic violence, uh, where the struggle with, with uh, developing a healthy brain that is primed uh, to deal with stress is compromised. Uh, and so uh, there can be a, a tipping point where um, it can be a, a, a failing grade or uh, something like an uh, um, um, uh, argument with a friend uh, that can, can lead to, to more uh, difficulties with uh, how one uh, regulates one's emotions and how one processes what's going on around them to the point where overwhelm leads to, I, I just can't handle this anymore. Um, so it's a very real uh, thing that uh, we're exploring in neuroanatomy and neurobiology and how uh, a brain is... Uh, 
is, is sort of developing through uh, events uh, like early childhood trauma. In fact, we even see it in, in other conditions such as cardiovascular, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, asthma, autoimmune conditions, diabetes. If you look back in the history of, of people with these kinds of conditions, including depression and anxiety and uh, suicidality, that there is significant trauma uh, in a significant portion of, of, of people who have these, these conditions or one or more of these conditions. Um, just adding to that, I think a lot of times we hear like depression, and anxiety, and we automatically think suicidal thoughts, and that's not the case. And so um, even with PTSD and eating disorders, we're looking at all of these and thinking, okay, all of these side effects are going to be happening to me or to my student. And that's not necessarily true. A lot of times you won't have any diagnosis or any traumatic event, and you'll still have suicidal thoughts. Or you may have had a traumatic event, or you have a diagnosis, and you don't have those. And so that isn't probably something helpful to hear because it just makes it even more complex, but it is kind of that perfect storm. The lock um, imagery was something that I really enjoyed. Um, it kind of helps visualize it that a lot of things contribute to those thoughts, um, and that's why assessment is so important. So thinking about assessment and kind of thinking about awareness and prevention, then what do we look for, and how do we take that first step with someone and get them to a place where they can get help. I'll go again. And this is open, yeah, for yeah. everybody. Um, I think the first piece I always think of is like disconnection. Like when someone is feeling disconnected from something or everything, that's a really good place to look. Um, and then also that feeling of being a burden. I think we see that a lot, and I see that a lot with my clients, is I am putting a burden on my family by just being here because I'm not doing well in school or I'm getting in trouble, or maybe I'm just like not living up to the expectations that I set for myself, even though mom and dad tell me they just want me to do my best. And so I think um, it's almost that like skewed perception of it's not really what's happening, but that feeling is so immense that it feels like they're a burden. That's mostly what I see. When it comes to assessment, uh, there are just various things that I, I've been doing this for, for a very long time. It just kind of just just is very automatic when I look at it. And, and just to educate you, to let you know what are the things that I look for in particular, uh, the history is, is very important. If there's a significant history of self-harm behaviors or previous suicide attempts, then I, I get very concerned if that person is coming in for a suicide assessment. The other things would be a, a psychiatric condition, uh, particularly mood disorders like depression or bipolar. Uh, substance abuse is a really big red red flag for me, uh, for someone who is coming in with suicidal ideation. Uh, and it's, it's related to when you're impaired, right, you lose judgment. You lose your faculties. You uh, lose the ability to, to think before acting, and uh, that could lead to very impulsive behavior, which oftentimes uh, that's, that's what it is, is uh, impulsivity um, in the face of distress when it comes to uh, suicidality, especially in youth. Uh, other things I, I look for uh, are uh, if the person is on medication, are they, are they taking it properly? Uh, a lot of youth, uh, when I prescribe medication, it has to be done regularly and it has to be taken in, in compliance with the instructions that I give. And oftentimes, uh, in order to alleviate stigma, a lot of, of, of young people will stop taking their medication or they do not want to take their medication anymore and they'll, they'll just abruptly stop it, which can lead to uh, really uncomfortable discontinuation effects. And that causes more of, um, well, I got to do something about this, um, leading to, to impulsive behavior. Uh, other things are like we talked about trauma, history of physical and sexual abuse is, is a high risk factor uh, for um, suicidality uh, is a very serious uh, potential outcome. Um, exposure to violence, uh, biologic factors uh, I look for as well, a history of impulsivity. In young kids, ADHD is, is something that uh, uh, scares me when I have a young child coming in uh, voicing suicidal thoughts uh, because, again, it's, it's about the impulsivity. Um, so those are, are some of the factors that I, I look for when it comes to assessing suicide. Um, 
and 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 really making sure that uh, the child is safe or or the client that's coming in to see me is is safe and has a, an appropriate support network. And once an assessment's made, does it mean automatically going to a hospital or some kind of other treatment? Um, what are some of the things that happen? Are there different levels of assessment, different levels of outcomes of assessment? Oh, yeah, sure. It's, it's, uh, it can be a, a very simple, okay, you know, I was really upset with my mom, and I said that, and, you know, I, I really shouldn't have, should have said that, but, but, hey, you know, I'll reassure them that you did the right thing and bring your child in here to be assessed and evaluated. And I reemphasize uh, uh, and reinforce uh, the parents' Uh, concern for for their particular child and uh, making sure that uh, that level of distress was tolerated and, and bringing them to see me. Uh, that being said, uh, it can be a very complex thing where I've had kids come in and they don't say anything. They're just sitting there and I'm asking questions and they're sullen and they're withdrawn and they're not talking. And I'll try to lighten things up with, with jokes or say things like, you know, um, I don't know, you're going to watch the, the Falcons lose with me this weekend or something like that. <laughs> and if I don't see any kind of response uh, that speaks to something in the future mm-hmm. that I'm hoping that they all kind of latch on to, then I get really concerned about that. Um, and so that, that can be a very difficult thing is, is getting young people to, to talk when in they're in that level of distress or oftentimes it's in... Um, 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 sort of in the situation or the context of, of conflict that brought them to see me in that acute crisis situation. So not all the time do you, do you have a, a suicidal, someone with suicidal ideation or threats coming in, they need automatic hospitalization. It is in the context of, you know, trying to ferret what led up to that and sort of reassurance from the child or the parent that uh, uh, this is something that is not going to be followed through on. Right. On um, the therapy end, when we're assessing, we can also intervene at any level of severity. So like Dr. Magat was talking about, sometimes it's just that thought, or like I said this because I didn't know what else to say and I was mad. And that still helps us intervene with coping skills, with problem solving skills, conflict resolution. And if it is something where they are more serious about it and they feel like they can't control those thoughts, that's when we intervene at a more severe level. So hospitalization isn't always where we go, but we can intervene in different ways to make sure we give the supports that um, the people in Milton need. So I want to remind everybody, you guys can, we're starting to see some questions come through. So you guys can go online and go to the Facebook page, submit your question. Also, if you're in here tonight, you can go out to our table or raise your hand. We'll make sure we give you cards. You guys can ask questions. Um, We've got a few more questions here, and then we definitely want to make sure that we open it up um, for you guys to be able to ask questions. Um, One of the things that, you know, we were just talking about, um, and it made me think of, sometimes people seem to be better uh, sometimes we don't even notice what's going on. I know as a part of um, both of your stories, you guys talked about, it would not have even crossed our minds that these students or uh, some people, whether it's in our community, friends that we know, neighbors that we know, men, women, uh, don't seem to be, we see it on the media, right? They just don't seem to be like that type of person. Um, so it's kind of a, a question um, for everybody. And especially, uh, I think, Megan, Dr. McGott, and Dr. Gorniak, um, what what do we need to know when maybe we're talking with someone who it just seems like, gosh, they seem like they've got everything going on, but now all of a sudden there's a change or there's a difference or it just didn't seem like that's the type of person that, you know, would have suicidal thoughts and it would just not even be something that would cross my mind. And yet we notice maybe something's a little bit different or something's a little bit off. For students specifically, um, and so I'll just speak for like the younger population, there is something that is taught, and I don't know if they do this with the signs of suicide in schools, um, but there's a training that Summit does, and we talk about ACT, and it's acknowledge, care, and tell. And so if you see a friend who is acting different, um, maybe you're just worried about them or they said something that's worrying to you, acknowledge that you hear it and that you're there for them by caring for them. 
um, and then tell someone. So tell a trusted adult, a coach, a mentor, a teacher. That's kind of how we look at it with students because I think along with, um, Sean, you were talking about harboring a lot of the guilt. They also harbor a lot of the responsibility when they don't have the adequate skills to help like an adult would. And so that's kind of the direction we take it with students. I don't know if you want to speak more to the adults. I'm sorry, what was the, the question? That <laughs> yeah, it's just sometimes we've noticed people, and maybe they're a little bit, like, just not themselves, and yet there's also just, they seem to be okay. Why, why would I even think that that person would have something going on? And yet, it's just kind of maybe it's behind the mask or it's behind something. How do I talk to my friends? How do I engage them? How do I help them? if it just seems like maybe something's a little bit off, but yet, gosh, this, this wouldn't be the person that seemed would have anything like this going on in their mind. How do I, how do I engage that person? Uh, what I, I do see a lot of are a lot of young people uh, trying to help each other, which is, which is not a bad thing. And uh, I think uh, connection is very important when someone is going through a very difficult time and is, is contemplating suicide. You want a, 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 a gathering of people of, of support. However, I, I think kids should really be careful about helping one another without receiving additional help from people who are trained to, to, to deal with a, a crisis, right? And so I see a lot of that. I see a lot of you know, kids they're waking up at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and getting on their phones, talking to their friend, and guiding them through not slitting their wrists or taking pills. Uh, and that's a burden that, that no kid should be responsible for someone's life in, in that way. So I, I really stress uh, to the clients that I see is, you know, I, I know that you mean well, but you're really not equipped to, to deal with this, and we really need to, to find someone or, or talk to your mom about talking to the parent of this kid that you're trying to help to, to get them the, the help that they need. I want you to still be supportive for them, but it's, it's really important that uh, um, um, you're not the only one involved with being involved in the care of, of, of your friend. Um, I, I think uh, Laura Lynn uh, mentioned her daughter and, and how there was kind of a sudden change in things and, and how uh, she, she sought help um, through getting all these tests and scans and, and that kind of a thing. And it can be something as, you know, a child uh, looking happy and seemingly okay, and then all of a sudden something devastating, like a sexual assault that goes unmentioned because of deep shame or guilt uh, uh, that leads to those, those symptoms of, of depression, isolation, withdrawal, trauma that you see where... Um, that person feels that there's no way out of that situation and that the feelings that they're having are going to last forever. Because you're talking about kids here who are experiencing a lot of firsts, whether it's a first boyfriend or a first day of class or a, um, a first date. Um, and the first ever intense emotions like a depression or a panic attack. Uh, and... I think it was Britt that mentioned the, the human brain does not, or was it Laura Lynn that mentioned that the human brain does not fully mature until you're 25 years of age. But the emotional seat of processing, right, the limbic system is fully alive and awake and online in adolescence. So you've got emotions that are high and the logical thinking of, of sort of executive functioning, of planning, of strategizing is still not online yet. So high emotions... Uh, intense pressure and stress from situations involved in, in a young person's life, uh, a, a history of, of firsts, and not knowing that there's going to be an end in sight. Um, you know, and, and kids are trying to keep it together, right? They, they see their friends. Uh, they see them happy and, and you know, oh, I need to be like that. Or my parents uh, expect these things of me, so I need to, to put on a strong front. Because emotions, uh, the expression of them, especially anxiety and depression, is a vulnerability that as an emerging adult, in order for me to be independent, I, I shouldn't express, right? Because I need to be strong. I'm, I'm, I'm coming into my own, right? So there's a lot of defenses. Uh, and just allowing kids the permission to talk about feelings and, hey, I'm open and talking about it you know, is very important. 
Well, and I think as a community, I mean, we bring up the trauma and everything, but think about, you know, 14, 15 year old kid. I mean, their definition of trauma, not to negate a true trauma in our adult sense. I mean, it's traumatic if they don't get 20 likes on Facebook. I mean, they're, the, the trauma, they're, they have a totally different perspective on things. And what we think is, you know, not that bad, they haven't, you know, made it past that level of maturity to know that this is not a big deal. So, and I think it just goes back to just the pressure on kids nowadays. There's just, with the social media and everything else, and... Um, not having the maturity to think things through. I mean, like Reagan was impulsive, and that's, you know, I think what led to this. And it was a traumatic event. It was the worst thing that ever happened to him, and he didn't, you know, think he could survive that socially. I mean, like going to school and with his family and everything else and had just a warped sense. And I just remember, too, that... At one point in time, someone posted something on social media, and it was a kid, you know, Snapchat, which supposedly goes away, um, and he said, oh, I'm Reagan Bean, and act like, you know, he's committing or dying by suicide. And for that child to, he wasn't thinking about how he was going to hurt somebody. He was trying to be silly or whatever, and... Immediately, everyone, you know, knew about it, sent it, you know, went crazy, went off on this kid, and immediately, all I could think about is now that kid has made a dumb mistake. He might feel like my child felt. Like, how am I going to survive this when I just did one stupid thing, and it was supposed to disappear on social media, and now everyone in the whole world is threatening me, and how could you do this, and how could you be this, and and so I think that's what we as a community and society need to do is, you know, talk to your kids about it, obviously, but all the kids, you know, if someone does something stupid, don't pile on, don't, you know, make it worse for that person. And I thank God it wasn't around when I was in high school because, <laughs> you know, I, I just can't imagine the way kids feel nowadays that, you're supposed to make mistakes growing up. That's how you learn. But when your mistake, the second it happened, is all over social media and everyone's judging that action before you even have a chance to process that you've done something wrong, that's, that's the sol- problem I don't have the solution for. So, you know, hopefully we can figure out how to fix that. So. I, I had a, um, a young a teenager uh, who posted something on Instagram and uh, didn't get as many likes as she wanted compared to her friends. She did get uh, a post from someone from England, I think, um, really downing her, what what she posted or what she put on Instagram, and that sent her into a spiral. Um, I think we've all been harassed or bullied or, or made fun of at some point in our lives, and social media just kind of amplifies that. And when you're talking about kids who are on social media for an extended period of time in isolation, uh, cyberbullying can be um, um, sort of lead to that that further isolation uh, and that further uh, self-criticism of oneself and and lowered self-esteem. She became suicide after, uh, you know, if, if, okay, if people in the United States, you know, are not posting and then someone from from England is doing that, man, it becomes this global thing now. Uh, and it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh. I just wanted to back up what Megan said. So we do in Fulton do um, a program called Signs of Suicide in sixth grade and in ninth grade. It is required. And then some schools additionally do it at other points. And it is that acknowledge, care, and tell. And you may not be the trusted adult. Our school counselors may not be the trusted adult. So we have to give them other ways. So we, we have two big ones in Fulton that we use. We have a tip line where it is everything from bullying to threats to suicide. It, it doesn't matter. Just send it into us. 
I always have my phone in my hand. We get them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And as soon as we see them, I see some of our administrators back there. The first thing I do is reach out to them, get their counselors on board, get their social workers on board and get in there. Um, the, the time lapse is, is not very long for, for all of us. So we just tell kids, tell us. If you're worried about a friend, please put this in. And they do. Um, kids do tell on each other. I know we think they don't, but they do. Um, and they'll, they put them in there all the time. They'll include screenshots from social media. They'll say, um, I had one that came from a parent. Um, it could be one of you sitting in here because it was in this area. Um, they were sitting down at dinner with their daughter. The daughter had mentioned some concerns about one of her friends from like years ago, but just seeing a change in her behavior, et cetera. And the parent sent it in. I could tell because the grammar was all perfect and the punctuation was perfect. Um, and I can tell it was, from, it was from a mom. And sure enough, she was spot on. And we intervened with that girl that next morning. And she had a plan and had means. And thank God that that mom said something to us. So parents, please use that tip line. Know that's there. If your kids are talking about their friends, if you hear things that they say, get that information to us. It's completely anonymous. We're not going to stock back down how we found it. We might try if we want more information, but sometimes we really can't. It is truly, we don't always know. So please use that tip line and please tell us if you're worried. Um, that, that's a huge thing for our kids to know, a huge thing for our parents to know about. Um, the other big tool we have is text for help. Um, it comes from Commissioner Ellis and his team. We started out with just our high schools. We're adding our middle schools this year thanks to their support. And the students can text a number. 24 hours a day, seven days a week in any of our middle and high schools, and a licensed therapist will respond in under three minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we have our tip line. They, they can send it in to get to us, but then text for help. They can text and completely anonymously. We will not figure it out unless they disclose with a licensed therapist all night and all day as well. So can we take... Yes, mm -hmm. and I actually believe they're out on the table, but if not, I'll be out there too and be able to give them to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got all the resources and everything out at the table, and we'll also make sure that they're posted online at the city's website. Um, and one of the other, um, GCAL, can you talk a little bit about that as well? Sure. Um, we don't rely on GCAL as much because we are blessed with text for help, and I know it better and feel a little more secure about it. Hmm. Um, GCAL is an app that Georgia released. Um, Governor Kemp put it out there. And the students can get on there. It does prompt them to give information, which for me, I, I can see a lot of kids turning it off because of that. Um, but it is accessible to all, to everyone in Georgia, really. And you can put your information in there, and a, a person will respond as well through there. Um, they will also call you if you'd rather be called. So all of those are resources for our kids to get help. Um, I just think we need to do a little better job of advertising them, and I own that. Um, Samantha Maxey is here from our communications department, and she and I have actually teamed up with some grant money to really get text for help out there. So if you see it kind of blasted everywhere in the upcoming month or so, that is, that's thanks to Samantha's work with me um, and the work of the commissioner board. So we're, we're trying to get them out there, but for us, it's, I, we're, we're not relying on anyone. We just want to make everybody talk. That's all, that's the takeaway from tonight. There are a million ways for you to tell us to get help. We just have to get our kids comfortable talking about this and get our adults comfortable talking about this. We can never be too safe. And Sean, I know you actually recently went through a training that was around uh, ministering to those with suicidal desperation. I know there's also some other trainings that are coming up for becoming a trusted adult that'll actually be taking place here. Um, what's some of the, the training that you received that you learned that you think would be really important for the people to know tonight? Yeah, I think the first thing is on the language, um, like, like you were talking about earlier, um, and it's been talked about a, a few times, um, with instead of saying committing suicide, die by suicide, there is a lot in the language. And one of the other language things that I learned is um, we talk a lot about students having suicidal thoughts, right? Um, but instead, what we were encouraged to do is talk in the area of having suicidal desperation instead. Um, the reason that being is thoughts can downgrade um, what's going on in their mind. Like, they're not just having thoughts. They're desperate, and they're, they have a desperation to get out of these thoughts, right? And that's what a lot of the time can lead to suicide. Um, in the training, they taught us uh, about how students who are in suicidal desperation a lot of the times feel trapped, alone, and in pain, right? Trapped, alone, and in pain. And so they feel like there's nowhere to go, that there's nowhere there to walk in it with them. Or um, like you talked about, that they feel like they're a burden. Um, or they, they feel like they're afraid. They don't, know, they don't know where to go. They don't know what to do next. And so all of a sudden, they feel like the only option left is um, suicide. And so one thing that I think we can do is be 
a trusted adult. And so if there is a training, I would strongly encourage um, all of you to go attend it because um, it teaches you how to have that conversation for these students to be able to externalize the internal struggle um, that they've been having um, for who, who knows how long. Um, and we, one thing that they encourage us to talk about is that suicide is an option, but it's just the worst option, right? Um, it's the worst option. And, but sometimes to these students and to adults, um, it's the only option that they can think of in their mind. And it's the option that plays like a broken record on repeat. And so what we do is we come in and say, hey, that's an option. That's the worst option. Let me present some other options that are maybe options you haven't thought about that are way more life-giving. Let's talk about those. Um, and one of the ways that we talked about doing that was from an acronym, uh, CALL, um, and it stands for Commit, Ask, Listen, and Lead. Um, and so the what commit stand, oh, it means is by having... Uh, three trusted adults in your circle or three trusted friends in your circle who you can go to and say, hey, when I am, if I do ever think about suicide, I can come and tell you and you're going to listen and help me get to the place that I need to be. I have those adults and I've never had those thoughts before, but each of us needs to have those because like we've been talking about, you never know who's going to all of a sudden go down a spiral and ha- be in this place of suicidal desperation. And the A is ask. Um, ask is probably Probably the hardest one and probably the most uncomfortable one for us. Um, I know it has been for me in the past um, because there, what, there has been, until you start talking about suicide, there is this stigma around talking around suicide. And so um, when, when what ask is, is when we see a student or we see an adult seeming like they're off, seeming like something's going wrong, like they're in a bad season, to go up to them and say, hey, hey I know, I've noticed you've been off. Have you been thinking about suicide? That's a heavy question. That's a hard question to ask, and we recognize that. But I would rather accidentally offend somebody by being wrong than risk not helping them save their life, right? And so I would, I'm going to ask the question, hey, are you thinking about suicide? And if they say yes, then let's get them to the place they need to be. Let's get them to a trained counselor. Let's get them to a place where they can find healing. If they say no, then like we talked about earlier, there's, there's something that's probably there, and let's get them the help that they need there. Um, the, the L is, first L is for listen. So we want to listen to them, and we want to ask questions if they are in suicidal desperation, like why now? Um, how will suicide help? Because these are questions they probably haven't thought completely through. And, and as they externalize, it might bring some relief that they've never had just by putting those words out there. And the second L is, stands for lead. And so in that moment, we want to lead them to a place where they can find help. And that's not going to always necessarily um, be the place for an immediate solution, but where it's going to be is a place for immediate safety. And so if they are in a place where they are very desperate, we're going to get them to a place where they're going to be safe, right? That's our, and the solution can come down the road. Um, a lot of the times in my experience walking with students, the first question that they'll ask me is, hey, if I share this with you, will you promise not to tell my parents? It's the first question I get 90% of the time. Um, And it's going to be tempting in that moment to say, yeah, 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 I promise. Because you want to hear what they have to say. You don't want you to say no, and then all of a sudden they're not share with you. But sometimes going to their parents can be the safest option immediately, right? And so I'm never going to make that promise that I can't keep. And so instead, I'll say something like, hey, if you can trust me enough to tell me, I need you to trust me enough to know what to do next. And so that's the call. And then suicidal desperation, kind of the two big things I learned. And so actually, this is a question kind of backing up to that uh, from online. When a parent hears from their child that they're concerned about a friend whose parents don't know, so similar to what you just mentioned, Mm -hmm. so this is for everybody, what is an advisable action for a parent or for another trusted adult when they learn that a child has thoughts but that that child's parent doesn't know? Please tell me. (laughs) That's the number one thing I'm going to say. Please put it in the tip line. Please tell us. Um, if you choose to remain anonymous, we can respect that. Um, and really, we, we, don't, we don't get into that, but just, just let us know. If we know, I can, I can get that child help. But if I don't know, there's nothing I can really do about it. So you can either put it through the tip line, if that's where you're most comfortable putting it through. You can tell a school counselor at a school, they will help. You can tell an administrator, they will help. But it's, it's don't, don't keep it inside. You, you've got to tell us so we can get there. So lots of different ways. Tell someone in the build, tell an administrator, tell a school counselor, put it through the tip line, and we will be on it. 
Dr. Grant, this one may be for you. Uh, has there been a rise in suicide since social media and smartphones? Hmm. That's a good question. I see another project in my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I haven't, haven't thought of that. Um, I don't know is my answer. Um, but there's always been, since I've trained in 2005, there's always been some online something or other. Um, so, and I just really appreciate hearing about what the schools are, how involved the schools are. Um, I always, re I had a 17 year old young man, um, African American man who hanged himself um, at his home. Um, and I sat, and I, and I learned not to, to do this, but I sat there, he had an online journal, and I read it. And it took me like two days to, to read the, the whole thing. And just reading it, I can tell there was something, this child was troubled. Um, and what shocked me was he was, I mean, he's two, three o'clock in the morning, he's writing his English paper, and he wrote an English paper titled, Why Life Sucks for Me. And all the teacher told him to do was to rewrite it. Mm. And then he turned in a paper, and I can't believe I remember, he turned in a paper on frivolous lawsuits was the next, the next thing. So to hear how involved the schools are really warms my heart um, because I, I think that, you know, our kids spend a lot of time there, and they, they see things. And my, my kids as teacher used to, like, I mean, my son in the song lyrics, some of the song lyrics, I went over to the school council, read this, read this. And my son's like, Mom, it's just a song. But I didn't like that song. You know what I mean? But it's, it's I had to get, I felt like I was getting the school involved. So I am, it really is, is great to hear that the school is there and the trainings are there, not only for, like, the students, but for, for the parents, and there is a way. But back to the original question, I don't know. <laughs> I would add, I think the social media issue is one that's a blessing and a curse in a lot of ways because we've talked about how much that provides connection, having phones with us, um, reaching out to people when we really maybe can't physically or feel like we can't. And then I also think, I read, um, and I can't remember the author's name now, but he was talking about how our children don't need us to have information anymore. They have the internet for that, but they need us to know how to navigate it. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the piece that stuck with me the most is they will know the answers. They can Google that. But when they find those answers, what do they do and how do they process it? And so I think that's kind of just speak on the social media. Like, what are we talking about with social media? It's kind of like the bigger thing, but I don't know the answer either. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, one of the things, thinking about the media, another question that came through, uh, and this is, again, open for everybody. What are your thoughts about the TV show 13 Reasons Why? Is it helpful or hurtful? I'll get it first. <laughs> I, I watched it because I wanted to see the interpretation of it because in my case, it was one reason. So I think it was good if you could watch it with your child because parents are not aware of many of the situations that teens deal with and that are such a big deal to them. Um, but yeah, I just think it really needed to show that it, it only took one of those things to happen. And um, how do we equip our kids should be more the question that the show should address is most kids can take 13 bad things happening to them. Mine only took one. Um, but how can we provide the tools so our kids can take however many things to get thrown at them? So. I would say, in addition, euphoria is just as much of a concern. If you do not know about that show, make sure your children are not watching it unattended, please. Um, there's actually a study done uh, on 13 Reasons Why, and there was an increase above and beyond the, the typical um, rates of, of suicide of about 25% in uh, the month after the show was aired in March, what was it, 2017, I think. Um, but this is not a, um, an uncommon phenomenon where we see clusters like this in sensationalized uh, sort of situations like um, the media might portray 
suicide when Mar- Marilyn Monroe uh, died by suicide. There was a spike in uh, uh, suicide attempts and, and suicide deaths in the country. And um, Goethe, who, who wrote a book um, called the, the Sorrows of, of Young Werther, that was in the, uh, the late 1700s. And it was about a young man who uh, was involved in a love triangle. And uh, his love went unrequited. Uh, he wound up uh, killing himself. Uh, he was a character who was uh, a post gentleman, uh, sophisticated, and uh, it was a literary sensation at the time in Europe, and it led to a rash of of mimic suicides as a result. Uh, so, when it comes to to uh, uh, social media and uh, events or, or programs like like Thirteen Reasons Why, there has to be responsibility attached with it. Um, I think uh, what Britt was saying is, is good, and it starts generating conversations about it. Uh, but there are scenes in that show, which you know, I watched it too, where uh, there are things, the suicide, the death of Hannah, who is the main character in the story. Uh, there were shrines that were built. There was a period of mourning. And I think a lot of kids will look at that um, and see that as something that they want for themselves, when you're particularly marginalized or isolated and no one's paying attention to you, no one's validating you, what better way to, to, to get all those needs met through killing oneself and having something like that? Um, and and um, uh, Chelsea was talking about uh, memorials and, and, and these kind of um, um, ceremonies. In fact, uh, there are Native American cultures that had to be educated about memorializing uh, young uh, Native American men who were... Uh, uh, dying by suicide on reservations, where there was these week-long ceremonies and celebrations honoring uh, the person who, who died by suicide. And uh, you know, people had to come in there and educate them how it was leading to more uh, suicidal ideation and, and deaths on, on the reservation, one right after the other. So uh, we really need to be careful about um, uh, sort of how suicide is portrayed and romanticizing it because kids will, will also gravitate towards that. People who are vulnerable will gravitate towards uh, this is a means to, to get recognized and validation. I had a, a, a friend who um, lost her son, um, and 13 reasons why. I remember she made it a point because it, she didn't want her son's friends to feel that it was their fault. And that's what 13 reasons why, you know, they, everybody, this is why you played a role, you played a role, you played a role. And that was something that really, you know, got to her where she had to reach out to her friends, her son's friends to say, listen, it wasn't you. Um, and so back to that, that guilt again. So um, that was one thing. I mean, I watch, and I watch these shows through a different lens. So I, I, I have my doctor hat on a lot. So I, I watched it that way. But to actually have somebody, you know, put real feelings and real words behind it and how it makes them feel, um, it's it's neat to hear the different perspectives from watching the same show. So it sounds like, I mean, watching with, making sure that you've got, and also recognizing that it's something that's going to be... very triggering, especially some of the scenes, and making sure you're very careful with something like that and being very educated as a parent or as anybody that's watching that, um, if you're going to go down. Yeah, with, I think Netflix even removed the, yeah. the scene <laughs> yeah. where, where <laughs> Hannah, um, it, it was a very horrific scene of, of someone um, um, you know, in the act of, of suicide Yeah, because um, it can be you know, quite triggering and engender these, these intense emotions. Um, yeah. It was heart rendering. Mm-hmm. When I, I know one of the other pieces of that, and also this ties with the question that just came in, uh, is making sure that teens know there is support in schools, that there is support to go to. I know you mentioned the text line, the tip line, making sure that people use that. Um, so the, the question was around what support um, should parents get um, for the child that's struggling? And so, Chelsea, maybe starting with you, and then I think opening this up to the rest of the community. Um, what support's offered in Fulton County Schools, and then for everybody else, what support's offered in the community for others, not just teens, but adults? Sure. Um, I brought my little list with me. So we, we did talk about our text for help line and our tip line. That's, that's the communication line that we use. Signs of suicide is the, is the prevention program that we use. So just know that we are 
we're talking about it. It is not something that is taboo in Fulton County schools, and we really do pride ourselves in that. We have other things, too. We have on-site mental health partners officially in every middle and high school in North Fulton this year, thanks to Summit and some other grant money we have figured out. So every middle and high school will have that on-site partner, and that really is removing barriers, offering training to parents, offering the support to teachers. So we're very excited about that. Um, and that's all things mental health. That, that can be struggling with anything. Um, another thing that we have is our youth mental health first aid training. We tried a little experiment this summer and I offered it to teachers and to any Fulton County staff to come in and get trained. Um, at the end of the day, I'm only ever gonna have so many counselors, psychologists, and social workers. So my attitude is the more trained eyes I can get out there, the better. So we had over 200 certified staff come from across Fulton this summer. So that was a good experiment. We'll do it again next summer, a little longer. And then also, I have another experiment coming. Um, I want to try youth mental health first aid training for our community. So the turnout here is very good. So I'm optimistic that our turnout will be good for this training. We're going to try it once, see who comes. Um, the, the target person for me is the soccer coach, the basketball coach, the drama teacher, the art teacher, people that are spending time with kids that may have no mental health background. Because it truly is first aid. It's how to see it, how to be worried about it how to know what you're looking at and who to tell is really what the training is. So we're going to try one um, in October. I'll make sure you guys get all that information through our different pathways. But I really want to start reaching out to the community and getting it out of schools a little bit and being a team, team effort on this. Um, so that is Youth Mental Health First Aid. Um, Steps A training, we've been offering that in lots of our schools. Um, it is really the, the, the Cadillac of therapy is DBT. It's changing that to a teacher-fied, lesson-planned, scripted version for them. So our schools are just starting to dabble in that a little bit. But again, it's, it's that removing access, removing stigma, getting our kids to talk about it. Um, any school can take it. Any school can be youth mental health first aid trained. There's lots of trainings of schools and requests from us. Um, some of it is up to them, and we kind of just do whatever they need. Um, if you really want to know, I'm not trying to plug myself, but if you follow me on social media, that is all the stuff we have going on. I have a couple parents in here that I know follow me and I interact with lots. Um, that's what's going on. If you look today, um, I'm really excited to look when we're done here because today was Fulton Goes Yellow. So I'm hoping that a lot of our schools were in yellow today and seeing that go on, we sent them a full toolkit for National Suicide Prevention Day. They got it two weeks ago. Some have full you know, month calendar long activities, things they're doing two and three times a week. So we really are trying to get in front of it, make it something that it's okay to talk about and provide all the supports we possibly can to our schools to, to break down some of those barriers. Anything else, Megan, uh, in the community for adults, other things we can be doing? Um, well, I think stemming from the schools, a lot of our school-based therapists, which is what I do, I'm at Cambridge High School and then Hopewell Middle School, um, and we always speak to parents before we meet with the student. And a lot of times, it's when there's a transition that's happened or a loss, and talking to that parent, you're realizing like maybe they don't have the supports that they need. And so Summit does have, we have a lot of school-based therapists, but we have a ton of other therapists and counselors as well. And so I always try to make that an effort of mine, and I think our other school therapists do, that yeah, your kid may need the supports, but you may need it too. And you're focusing on them, and you need to focus on yourself as well. And so I think coming from that holistic standpoint is we have some of these resources, and if we're not that one for you, we'll find the one that is. Okay. And I also know that they're September 22nd, actually back here in Milton City Hall, there'll be a trusted adult training. And that training goes for adults that want to be available for our schools, um, available for our students, but then also available in your community, available for friends, um, children, students, and also neighbors on your cul-de-sac, on your street that could use somebody that could uh, know how to engage in this conversation. And now that you guys have been here tonight, you know that, and you also know some of the things to say and to do. And so that's coming up uh, September 22nd, 5 p.m., Trusted Adult Training here at uh, City Hall. Uh, one other question that just came in, and I think it also goes back to, Laurel, and something that you mentioned in your story um, was the black box warnings and medication and, and prescribing medication. Dr. McGott, um, what is the protocol that a psychiatrist follows for prescribing, finding the right medication versus the wrong one, and how to manage side effects that might make the person feel worse or those side effects that could even lead to suicidal ideation? <laughs> So the black box warning is a warning that was placed on antidepressants 
all antidepressants in 2004 by the FDA in the use for, for young people uh, below the age of 25. And these apply to medications like, uh, they're called SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like Prozac, Impaxil, Zoloft, these kinds of medications, along with, with other older medicines like the tricyclic antidepressants, uh, such as uh, clomipramine, um, nortriptyline, uh, these older medications as well. And it was, uh, uh, it was it was it came about from a noticeable signal with an increased uh, uh, incidence of, of suicide with people who are on Prozac. Uh, when Prozac came out in the late 80s, it really revolutionized uh, the practice of psychiatry and uh, prescribing medication because tricyclic antidepressants you had to do a lot of extensive workup, EKGs, monitoring of levels. And Prozac, uh, like I said, just re revolutionized uh, medication uh, administration for, for depression uh, because it was very simple. You prescribed it, and uh, over the course of four to, to six weeks, you could see incredible improvement uh, with depressive symptoms uh, with minimal side effects. Uh, but in the early 90s, there was this uh, increased incidence from a, a particular population study. And then there was more evidence coming out that uh, perhaps uh, Prozac was, was causing some unknown phenomenon of, of increased suicidal risk. And so the FDA convened a panel in uh, 2003 looking at uh, various studies at, at nine different antidepressants. And they did find uh, somewhat of a, a, an increased signal, but it was a very low one. And we're talking on the spectrum of about a 2% 2, 2 increased risk versus a, a sugar pill, but significant enough for them to put the warning. Um, and subsequent studies have revealed that uh, the, uh, the risk is even less than that, that some studies are showing even less than 1%. Uh, and the consensus now is that it is uh, a risk but not conclusively associated with suicidal ideation attempts or completions. Uh, and there has not been any known uh, completions of suicide uh, in uh, the pediatric population from these particular studies. Um, there has been only suicidal ideation behavior, but no completions. And this is looking like thousands, thousands of kids, population-based studies um, uh, that, that reveal um, a, a, a marginal risk. But still, the black box warning remains. Uh, I have a discussion with my clients when it comes to, to starting medication um, and that we need to monitor closely. The FDA guidelines suggest that when you start a child on medication, and I, to be honest with you, I, I don't want to put a child on medication if, if I don't have to, right? And I think a comment was made that these medications are being prescribed willy-nilly, and that is true. Um, and the thing is, is that um, when you have something as simple as Prozac or medicines like it, there is a tendency to sort of latch onto that and use that whenever you come into an office. And, and I'm not talking about a psychiatrist's office. I'm talking about primary care offices who were prescribing these medications because of the safety profile uh, and not doing a thorough history in as much as of a 15 or a 30 minute visit that, that a primary care doctor can do. Um, and there was not close monitoring of it, right? It, it would be, okay, we'll put you on this medicine, see you in three months, right? Um, so the black box warning did achieve some good things in the sense that, okay, you just can't put a person on this medication and say bye-bye to them and have them come back months down the road. There needs to be close monitoring because the signal was you see that increased suicidal risk, although it's low, in the first weeks after starting a medication like this. Uh, and there are different hypotheses as to why that is in the pediatric population, because we don't see that in the adult population. One of them is possibly that the child does not have uh, a unipolar or a run-of-the-mill depression. That is actually bipolar depression. And the difference is, is that depression is, unipolar depression is, is just what it is. It's, it's depression, but bipolar depression can potentially manifest as, as manic symptoms. Uh, and that doesn't fully become manifest oftentimes for people who go on to develop bipolar until you're in your, your 20s, right? And so kids might present with depression, but not the manic state. And when you put them on an antidepressant, it skyrockets agitation, impulsivity, mania, 
and and that obviously leads to uh, potential outcomes that um, are, can be disastrous, right? The other thing is, um, you know, we talked about this earlier about the the brain being immature. Uh, kids are impulsive when it comes to agitation. Um, there's limited options in terms of what to do, and self harm, suicidal thoughts, ideation is is become something to problem solve around the agitation that they're experiencing. Drug use is also rampant among adolescents and couple that with a brain that is immature and then you put kids on medication. Is that why it's, it's leading to that increased risk? So those are the conversations that, that I have with parents when it comes to putting a child on medication. I try to, to shunt more towards therapy with mild or, or, or even moderate depression because it works. Therapy is, is helpful. Uh, but when you're talking about severe cases, right, um, that's when you know, medication support um, can be life-saving, right? Uh, but it requires that responsibility in, in doing an appropriate evaluation and work of getting family history. Uh, if, if there's a family history of bipolar, for instance, right, or talking about drugs, uh, talking about um, sort of past uh, ways of coping, uh, biological factors, all these kinds of things that go into the evaluation that, that might be difficult for, say, a primary care doctor to do in 15 to 20 minutes, you know, at a, at a visit for depression. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I want to end tonight by thanking all of our panelists, um, you guys, for being here. Um, but more importantly, um, to Laura Lynn and to you, Brett, um, for you guys being here and for sharing your stories with us, um, helping us to understand a little bit of what you've gone through. And I think it's just a, a little bit for us to then be able to take that and to try to ask questions and to try to explore and understand a little bit about how we continue to move forward so that this, this doesn't happen again um, and that we can support one another in empowering our community to be a community that uh, is aware and can prevent suicide in the future. And so thank the two of you for being here tonight. Uh, one of the other questions that came in, and this is the last thing that I want us to do this evening, is... Uh, the question asks, what's one thing that we can do? What's one thing we can take away um, from tonight that we can really make sure um, to help with awareness and prevention? And so here's what I want you guys to do is, uh, if you would, turn to someone next to you. And here's what I want you to do is I want you to use the word suicide in a sentence with someone next to you. Go ahead and do that now. <laughs> 